Simon. Those spay casts with a single-handed rod. That just Thanks. opens up a whole new world to spay casting. Sure does. I mean, not only do you use the big double-handed rods, but you're using the little trout rod doing the same cast. you got to use them. you got to use it. If you've got these narrow rivers, the big rod like that's going to tie you up. That's wonderful. I just want to really thank you for coming over here and showing us how to do this. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. But it's um, things like your lines that you develop for spay casting, the accelerator and the wind cutter have just revolutionized spay casting. Well, thanks. It's I mean, you could see in the videos how easy it is. It just flies out. Well, it's, up, it's guys like you, the experts, who've helped us develop those lines. So. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's, uh, I think we've got some in. All righty. Thanks very much. <laughs> Show me that turbo spay again. That, hey, man. That snake roll, actually. You like this one? Oh, I love this cast. That is wonderful. You develop that cast. It's just amazing. Yeah, catches a few fish. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Do it again. Do it again. No. Nope. Yeah, that's great. Oh, had a pull. Did you have a pull? Yeah. She. It Give works. Me a break. It works, man. <laughs> <laughs> we are now on our way to the Panoy River, way up above the Arctic Circle on the Kola Peninsula in Russia. Hi, I'm Jim Vincent from the United States. I'd like to welcome you to this video. With me are two international cat fly casting instructors, Leif Stavo from Sweden and Simon Gosworth from England, two of my friends and Jim. We call ourselves the Spay Bros. <laughs> We're on the Panoy River here in Russia. We've been a long time waiting for this. We've got a great show for you. We're going to be showing you some single-handed rod techniques and double-handed rod techniques and the practical application for catching fish. So we've got, a, I think, a great show for you, and I'm looking forward to it. Yes, Jim, I think uh, this is going to be very exciting. I'm uh, just so happy to be with you guys here, and uh, I think it's a unique opportunity, really, to show different types of techniques from different parts of the world and how they can interact, and also that there is a red thread going through all of this, you know. Absolutely. It would be a great video, showing, as you say, everything, two-handed rod, one-handed rod. Yeah. It would be ideal for everyone to, to look at and learn from this. Yeah. Well. We're going to get to it. <laughs> yeah, stay with us. Hope we have a good show for you. <laughs> Well, here we are on the River Panoy in the Kola Peninsula of Russia. This is a typical pool where you've got a spay cast. You've got high cliffs, high rock faces behind you. There's no way you can do any form of overhead cast. So the spay cast family, the single spay, the double spay, the snake roll, those are the casts you're going to need to fish a pool like this. The single spay on the left bank of the river like this means you're using your right hand. Nice and easy for the average caster, sticking to the right hand. Problem is when the wind blows downstream, you're going to have the wind on your right, so you've got to do a double spay or a snake roll. This means transferring to your left hand, changing your feet over so your right foot is forward, and in the case of the double spay, bring your rod across to your right, back to the left, little flick, perhaps some end here to slow the line down. But we've got a bit of current racing through the pool today. The mend is an optional point. It's something that you do if there's a current like this that's racing down, you've got to slow the fly down. And the spays allow you to put this mend in without causing any problems with the fly dragging or anything. An alternative to the double spay, maybe disturbing less water. It's a good cast for when you've got slow pools in front of you and you don't want to disturb the water. An alternative to that is the snake roll. It's a quicker cast. Again, I'm going to be with the left hand. It just doesn't disturb the water in front of you and goes out a lot faster than the double spay. 
The same thing, you can put a little mend into it if you want to slow the fly down. But with all these casts, let the fly come right round to the dangle before you do the next cast. One of the other great advantages of the snake roll is when fishing from a boat like this. You're positioned in the middle of the river, you've got a downstream wind, or you've got your guide on your right hand side. If you do a double spare, you're pulling the rod across your right, round to the left, forward. Now that's the safest cast because it keeps the line away from the guide. The problem with a double spay is that you're pulling the line on your upstream side. You might loop it around the guide, you might loop it around the rollocks or the anchor rope, and you're certainly not going to be put in the best positions of the river if you start hooking your guide. So the left hand side, you can do a snake roll. It's the safest cast of all because the line stays off the boat, below the engine. It's not coming up to you, it's not coming up under the guide, it's not going to hook the rollocks, and the line goes out equally well, but a lot safer for everyone else. One of the great problems of casting with what's seen as the wrong arm, i.e. being a right-handed angler, your left hand, is the hook. It's, a, it's a sort of a term where you use your, your cast by using the wrong arm in the wrong plane. Now I'll show you what that means, it's sort of all double duck, but I'll show you what it means. When you go forward, the right hand can do two things. If it pushes the rod out to the right, out to the left, sorry, here, you push the rod out that side, when you come forward, being right hand dominated, most people will pull the right hand back again. Now as a result of that, by pulling the right hand back, you set up a little torque or a little twist into the forward stroke. It's also caused by a roll of the shoulders. You turn your body around like this to, to get the back cast back, and then a lot of people, again with the wrong arm, roll the shoulder to come forward, and again set this twist up and this torque up. Now, I'll show you what I mean. I'll actually do a cast incorrectly first, and then show you how to overcome it. It's just something by using the wrong arm. Get the right arm across, pull it back to your right hand side and the rod hooks right across the plane of the target and the thing falls in a miserable heap in front of you. It doesn't go anywhere. And the same with the roll of the shoulder. You'll get exactly the same result. Just let it wash straight. Okay, you do your double spay in the usual way and then this left shoulder rolls round here and you end up hooking. Now it's a very, very common problem with anglers using the wrong arm. And that is because, or not the wrong arm, but the sort of the unnatural arm. And that is down to not enough practice. The only way to overcome this is get a load of practice with this wrong arm. Fish left-handed, do anything, but just keep practicing with the left hand. Now the right technique with this wrong hand is to keep the rod traveling in the plane you want the forward stroke to go. And this is accompanied by, you've got to have a little bit of thought in this. You've got to think about your shoulder, as I say, because you're, you're not, tend not to think about the left hand, you tend to forget what your arms and shoulders are doing. But remember that the shoulder can't swivel or twist, it's got to travel straight in the direction that you want the cast to go. And that way you'll avoid getting this twist and this torque and your line will go out much easier considering it's your wrong arm. Like the single-handed rod caster, you've got to be able to control the forward loop. You've got to be able to reduce the size of your loop. The less air resistance you have of your loop on the forward stroke, the tighter and the easier the forward stroke will go out. It means you can shoot line, you can get a better turnover without putting a lot of effort into it. And again, just like using the single-handed rod, it's controlled by the amount of power and amount of follow-through that your rod has on the forward stroke. It also has something to do with the action of the rod. A fast tip action rod will tend to give you a, a tighter forward loop on any cast, whether it's spay, overhead, whether it's a double rod or a single-handed rod. What you're trying to achieve is this very, very tight forward loop. You see how narrow that is? The loop is tight, it unrolls through the air, there's no air resistance on it, and it takes a lot of slack with it so you can shoot a good length of line. And this tight loop is achieved by this crisp, short forward flick. Very short forward flick, not a lot of effort, not a lot of follow through of the rod, gives you a tight forward loop, makes it unroll very easily. The contrary to that, where it can go wrong is when you try to put a little bit more effort in, maybe because there's a wind or maybe because you're not getting the cast out or you want to get that extra bit of distance and a big swipe comes into the thing, you get a large loop and it doesn't go anywhere in terms of distance and it falls in this unsightly heap in front of you, it doesn't turn over, they end up in a few wind knots apart from anything else. 
So bad technique, doesn't matter if it's a double spay, a single spay, if it's your left or right hand, bad technique is on the forward stroke coming, following through with the rod, opening the loop up. Better technique, shorter, crisper forward stroke, and you can see the rod stops almost 11 o'clock on the, on, the, on the forward stroke, maybe 10.30, something like that. And the higher that rod is, and the crispier and shorter the flick is, the tighter the loop will be, and the better the cast will unroll. Let's talk about the overhead cast in two-handed rods for a while. The two-handed rod is a powerful tool. It's a long rod, it's got the potential of throwing long lines, and that's what we're going to talk about here for a little while. The overhead cast is basically used for the extraordinary distances. In general, you'll be using the spay cast a lot more, because it's a more efficient, more energy-saving cast than the overhead cast. But sometimes, when you want to reach the optimum distance, that's when you go for the overhead. There are a few basic things that are really important to make an overhead cast work properly. And I want to start from the very beginning, and we're going to start with the grip, because I think grip is very, very much the cause of a lot of problems that you have in the overhead cast, and also it's the key to successful overhead casting. If we start to look at the handle, we've got two sections on the handle. We've got the lower butt section, and we've got the foregrip section. We're going to use both, and the lower hand, which in this case, as I'm casting now, is my left hand, will be forming a ringed grip around the bottom of the butt part of the handle like this. The reason for this is I want these three fingers to be free to put line upon when I take line in after a cast. I'm going to show you that later how I'm doing that, but just leave it at this for the moment. My upper hand, I want to put somewhere right in the middle of the grip, and I don't want to put too tight and too hard a grip on this upper section. I want to hold it firmly, but yet not crampy. Like this. If you want to keep your thumb on top, that's fair. If you want to keep your thumb on the side, you can do that. The reason for this position with your upper hand is that a lot of the time when you start the double-handed casting, it's very easy to overpower the stroke on the forward cast. You get that immediate feeling, you want to push the rod forward in the final delivery. And by doing that, it's very easy that you throw a tailing loop into your line. So, by moving your hand down just slightly on the grip, so that you actually get your hand position somewhere right in the middle of the, the upper grip path, you have a perfect position which takes away just a little bit of that excess power that you would get on, on the foregrip. Your butt hand is really the hand that's going to do a lot of the work, both in the back cast and the forward cast. This one is the one that's going to generate the speed of the cast by pushing the rod away from you in the back cast and actually pulling the rod back towards your body when you deliver the forward cast. So this is a very important hand and your upper hand is basically just positioning the rod and steering the rod forward and backward during the cast. If we look at it from this angle now, I put my hand at the bottom of the butt section like this. I slide my, my upper hand to about the middle part of the handle like this. By doing this, I get a position with my elbow, which is fairly tight towards my body. From here, I've got a good position to pick up line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close this section, my elbow angle, I'm going to come up with my upper hand towards my shoulder, the same time as I'm going to push out with the butt section of the handle. I'm going to generate a lot of power and a lot of speed by doing this. Slowly starting my pickup, pushing out, butt section like this. Here I got my position for forward cast to start. Pick up, pull back in. Butt hand out, butt hand comes back in again. You see the angle of my elbow closing and opening accordingly. This way, I'm basically doing all the work with the butt hand, and this one is just controlling the rod. 
Now, as I was saying earlier, I want to use the whole of this hand. I'm just not using it for just applying power. I'm also using it to keep my line on. And these three fingers will be loose, hanging up loose line on like this. When I let go of my cast, I open the fingers and the line is really coming loose very easily this way. What I do is I put my first loop on the water as my largest one, hang up the line on my little finger like this, keep going. Second loop is a little bit smaller. That way I can avoid tangle. And let go. You can actually see that a lot of the movement is an upward-downward movement with both elbow and butt hand. The drift in the double hand overhead cast is very important. I, I need to get a pickup in my back cast. I need to come up with my arms, raise them above my head so that I can get a longer stroke, a smoother application of the power and also get a nice early stop in the forward delivery. I'm going to tell you one thing that's very important about this cast and it's also one of the causes that really make you a bad cast now and then. The reason for doing the drift and also the movements that we've been going through here now is that we want the application of power and the rod bend to start right down here in the handle and move up through the whole rod and finish off up the top. And one of the major faults that you probably may do now and then, especially when you get a little bit anxious to get far out there where the fish is just out of reach or just on the level of where you'll be able to cast is that you try and push forward with your arm too much. That way you're going to bend the rod but you're only going to bend about half the rod. You're not going to use the second half of the rod very well. And if you look at the position I have just as I'm starting my forward cast you can see I've drifted backwards and I'm ready to get into my forward cast. And when I do that, I want to make sure my elbow is coming back down here again. Because if elbow gets back down towards the body at the same time as your butt hand is hitting somewhere around your waist or your leg, you know you're in for a very good stop, a high, nice stop, and also smooth application of power through the whole rod. But if from this position, I push forward. I'm going to end up with a low rod tip, and I'm also going to end up with this loading of the rod that only bends about 50% of the whole thing. Look at this again. Look how I'm loading the rod by actually lowering my elbow and pulling with my butt hand at the end of the cast. I'm coming up, I'm coming back down with my elbow. Look at this. There. There I go. When I do that right, I can feel it because I really feel the bend all the way down the grip like this. That's a good feeling and you can also see it on your loop as it goes out. It's a nice tight loop and it generates a lot of energy. Don't forget that elbow. That's really important in your cast. The Panoy River Company generously extended its staff, guides and facilities to make this video production possible. The Panoy River is without parallel with its abundance of fish and variety of water. The camp provides cuisine and comfort in an extremely remote location. Attention to details and excellent service make the resort one of the finest in the world. For the Atlantic salmon fly fisher, it is nothing short of paradise. Okay, we're going to show you the fisherman's point of view. I've gone to a wet fly now, and hopefully he takes this one. I always let my fly come all the way around. Sometimes a fish, uh, whether it's the steelhead or Atlantic salmon, will follow that fly 
and actually take it, take it right on the dangle. That's a hard place to hook them, but I've had a lot of fish do that. Especially steelhead, because steelhead tend to be in shore anyway. No, he's not showing much interest on this. I'm going to go back to that big giant dry fly, the one he first came up on. Big Wally Walker. Wally Waker. This thing pushes some water. That's the other difference I see between Atlantic Salmon and Steelhead is that uh, steelhead li usually like a little less expression. In fast water, this is a great fly to find fish, but generally I have to use a smaller fly to pin them. But Atlantic salmon really like a big fly. I'm not sure why. At least over here in, on the Pinoy. In this case, I'm not using a double turtle. I'm just using an improved clinch just to get onto the eye of the hook and then I'm going to put the half hitches on the side of the fly with the bend facing downstream. Here's the bend, the hook, the bend is facing downstream and those half hitches, which is just a real easy thing to do, bending it across, will be on that side. So they'll be on the shore side. That way it's always pulling against the current and causing a V wake. Oh, that looks good. I got him. Isn't that funny? He looked at everything, but that's the one he wanted. Now, he barely broke the surface to grab that. I don't think he's hooked real well. I didn't drop as much line on him as I should have. I wanted that big giant fly. I must have thrown six, seven patterns on him. I like to keep that fly, that rod tip low. About this point, I'll start backing into shore. This is not one I can just lift. Oh, yeah! <laughs> That's our fish. Whoa, he came off. Long range release. Well, I got the best of them. And that's what the fun of these double handed rods are all about. You can just control that fly, make it wake all the way in, dance it in the water. It's just great fun. I'm going to try to get another one. You know, the point of this is that we went through all these flies. We raised them on the big dry fly. We did a lot of different things, but we stayed with that fish. Just like you're gonna be fishing a selective trout. You're changing patterns. Uh, you're going to a mergers. You're going to dry flies. You're going to the dun. You're going to the spinner. You know, whatever it takes to get that fish to take. And we do the same thing with Atlantic salmon and steelhead. You don't have to just quit after you get a rise and a miss. Okay, we went to, with the uh, Wally Walker. First thing that got him to come up and snap at it. He actually chased it going away and he got a little bit pricked. I, could f I remember I could feel him getting a little bit pricked on it. I took that off and put the wet fly which the uh, black and, and red. That didn't work. Tried this other one that uh, uh, was a similar color pattern but it was smaller in silhouette. Much smaller fly. Went back to a dry...